I'm just going to start by introducing uh, the Women's Committee to you. So my name is Sarah Smith, I'm Chair of the Women's Committee. Uh, the role of the Women's Committee is to promote uh, the role of women in the economic profession in the UK. Uh, so there are many ways we could promote gender issues. Um, the, uh, this session here, you'll be uh, relieved or perhaps disappointed to know that we're going to follow a rather conventional economics approach. Uh, and we're going to focus on um, kind of evidence on the status of women in academic e economics with some uh, research on pay uh, and rank and also some research on the submission of women um, and academic economists to the, uh, to the last rep. Um, so that's the approach more generally of the Women's Committee. So we're interested in collecting evidence on the representation of women in academic economics. And there's a biennial survey of uh, departments of economics, which then allows us to say something about the representation of women uh, across the UK and at different levels in the uh, academic profession. Uh, we then identify issues that uh, might need addressing. So last year, the focus of this session was on undergraduate economics. And one of the issues that came out was that girls were much less likely to be offered a-level economics than boys were, and A-level economics is the main channel through which uh, students progress into economics at university. So if we're worried about why there are so few women studying economics at university, we might need to reach out to schools. So following on from that, we also identify possible activities that we might want to take to address some of the issues that are raised. So um, we've do, uh, done mentoring for junior researchers, uh, we're supporting departments with Athena Swan, and we're also, as I said, starting to think about reaching out to schools to think about improving the flow of uh, people into uh, undergraduate economics. Um, so I've only very recently taken over as chair of the Women's Committee. I took over from Silvana, who went on uh, to serve on the Monetary Policy Committee. And before that, Karen Mumford was chair uh, from 2009 to 2016. Um, so yeah, she did uh, a huge amount of work to sustain the biennial survey, and I think that really has made the Women's Committee quite, uh, given it a powerful voice in terms of thinking about uh, women in academic economics. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome Karen Bass to present the paper. So she's going to talk about uh, pay and rank uh, in uh, economics departments. And then Christina, who works as a research assistant on a number of the surveys, is going to present a paper on uh, REF submission. So we're going to have those two papers, and then we're going to have two discussants, which are going to comment on the papers, but also comment more widely on some of the issues that they raise. And then if there's time, uh, we'll open up the floor uh, for questions. So thanks very much. I'd like to introduce Karen. Hi. Um, can you, you can hear me, can't you? Um, this is a joint paper with myself and Christina. We started it when I was chair of the Women's Committee and Christina was the PhD student rep on the Women's Committee. Just to set a little bit of context, the Women's Committee started collecting data on UK academic economics in 1996. Um, in 1996, uh, women were 18% of the workforce. They're now 28% in 2016. 13% um, of all posts were professorial, and um, now 28% are. And in 1996, women were 4% of the professors, now they're 16%. They were 10% of reader senior lecturers, now they're 26%. And there were 17% of lecturers, and now they're 35%. So women have basically doubled their representation in the workforce. They've moved more into professorships, but they're still relatively rare amongst them. So what I'm showing you here is within gender what the rank positions look like. So in 1996, on the left hand side here, you can see that roughly 6%, roughly 7% of the women were professors, and now it's close to 20%. And up here you can see the lecturers are declining over that time period. And for men, in contrast, scales are different, but for men, being a professor, which is the dotted line, it's now the most common career grade. So all other things being equal, you're most likely to be a professor now if you're a man by the time you finish. So what we want to look at is pay gaps. Studies of academic pay gaps are actually comparatively rare in the literature. Um, there was a really nice survey by Ward in 2001 looking at academic salaries in Scotland. 
There's a nice study in Princeton, for Princeton 2002, finding an 18 unconditional gap and a conditional gap of 8% once they control for publications and experience mainly. Um, for the UK, there was a working party looking at ethnicity in 1999, and then they then went on and used that data to look at gender pay gaps in 2005, and they found an unconditional gap of 17.7 .7 points and a conditional gap of 9.4. The other really interesting study that's been done just recently, there might be others that I don't know of, but um, the LSC study is really, it's a great paper, it's well worth looking at. Um, they found an unconditional gap of 16.5 and a conditional gap of 10.5, but different components of the study come up with different, depending on what they're conditioning on. We'll come back to that. Okay, so what we did um, two years ago, between February 26 and March 28, we sent out a survey to individual academics. It actually went out to heads of department through Tudor, and then the heads of department distributed the research link to members. We tracked it over the time period. Any departments that we didn't have any responses for, we got back in touch with the heads of departments and asked them to send again. It was collected in Coltrex and anonymised. We also, at the RES conference, handed out hard copies and we got another couple of dozen usable responses. Combine the data with the RES Women's Committee surveys that are done biannually and checked by the departments annually. So in total we had 668 responses, but quite a few of them looked like people were just having a bit of a sticky beak and didn't actually fill in most of the survey. We ended up with um, 540 usable ones on job rank. People were more discreet about their salaries, so we only ended up with 380 that had usable information on salaries as well. Okay, so. I don't want to spend a lot of time telling you this because you can have a look at the paper. But basically our measure, um, our dependent variables, full-time equivalent annual salary, and on average, um, the males averaged 60,000 in the UK in 2016 and the women won 55, 389. Sorry, the women won 52, the average was 55. It's a gap of 15 log percentage points. So this is what our data looks like. That's the whole sample, males and females. I don't want to go through all of this, but um, what's interesting is you can see that um, there's a surge of younger women coming through the data set, and that comes up later in our regression analysis. Especially in yeah, here, a bunch of women. So the distributions are just slightly shifted. There are a younger cohort of women coming through. Um, then um, another difference in the data set is um, we have more women that are working on research contracts, and so there's more women with no PhDs. Um, and then otherwise, it's a bit. The other thing that's really interesting, we thought, was um, mentoring. It's very similar for men and women. And also this competition thing. Women are much more likely to say their workplaces are competitive than men. There's a whole literature on this that says that women shy away from competition, so we'll have a look at that too. Um, not that much difference on whether their workplace is cooperative. In terms of um, what our rank looks like, we have an overrepresentation of professors, male and female, in the data. In some ways that's useful for us because it means we have 45 female professors, which gives us enough to be sensible about. In the 1999 study they only had seven female professors. Um, and we have an underrepresentation of lecturers. Earnings function, we run a very standard semi-log earning function. So here's our wages on the left-hand side, um, constant term. Then we're running a pooled regression and um, we've got all of our um, characteristics that we think are associated with wages, a gender dummy and an error term. Okay, so we basically believe in a human capital story. So we think wages are going to be related to characteristics that are associated with um, productivity. And I'll tell you these in just a second. And then we're going to augment our earnings function with demographic characteristics, workplace characteristics, and labour market control characteristics. And here they are. So I've basically just put the columns under those types of categories, but we're running one OLS regression, and these are them all, and the asterisks show how significant they are. So um, there's our conditional gender pay gap. Then um, under demographic, you can see here, we 
for our demographic characteristics. So we don't find any demographic variables are important for the wage gap except for gender and age. And you can see age here is really clearly significant compared to the youngest omitted group. We'd expect that because we haven't got job rank in these regressions yet and a lot of um, wages associated with seniority and promotion. Here's our productivity measures and all of these are behaving the way that we would expect um, except maybe for excellent teaching score. We never got any significant response between being an excellent teacher and higher wages. These are our workplace characteristics and up here we've got this interaction really going down between um, being in a top six department that was based on the last ref rankings, um, an old university which was that it was a university before the 1992 reforms and um, working in London University because of course they have London weightings as well. So there's overlaps between them. This one here, kind of interesting, the effect's not large. Um, but it kept came out significant, and that's working in a more feminised workforce. And so perhaps the story is that um, some workplaces are a bit um, over-segregated and maybe a large number of women means there's less bargaining power. Um, and then this one here is the network. That question was about, do you have a network um, that you can use for your research area in your workplace, and it's negative? We were expecting it to be positive, but perhaps it's a selection issue in that if you're not doing well, perhaps you're encouraged to join these networks or you go out and do it. Of the labour market type response characteristics we put in there, external appointment, yeah, it means that you were hired into your current job from an outside position. So basically perhaps that means that you're not happy with your current job or your current employer hasn't matched your outside salary. has a really strong effect and what we found is that not only was it very similar for males and females to have outside offers, yeah. but actually we also find if you look in the paper there's no significant difference between the rates of return on having an outside offer by gender. Yeah. So it looks like women are going to get outside offers like men do and the departments respond to them. So it doesn't look like you've got this captive, women are not mobile, good little good little servants hypothesis we're working. Okay, so decomposing the gap, there was um, 15 log percentage points in the raw data. Um, the unexplained component was <coughs> 9 log percentage points, the explained is um, 5.98. So roughly one third explained, roughly two thirds unexplained. If we decompose the explained, we find out that most of it is due to demographics and 98% of that demographic effect is due to age. So mostly the explained components coming at us from age difference between the gender. And there's also a little bit on this feminized workplace. If we look at the unexplained component, then um, what's driving it is gender differences in rates of return to um, characteristics associated with productivity. So we're looking at a 9.1 log percentage points unexplained gender pay gap. And we think we've, we've done a fairly good job of capturing factors that we think or characteristics that we think would be affected with pay. Job rank. Okay, so maybe there's also a difference between um, promotion and getting into different job ranks. So we run ordered probates. I'm just going to tell you about the characteristics that are significant. If you look in the table, you can see all the insignificant ones. Um, so here's teaching fellows, research lecturer, senior lecturer, professor. I've highlighted lecturer and professor so you can see the difference. Yeah? Typically we get quite tidy results across. So here's our gender pay, sorry, here's our differences in probabilities of being in these job ranks. So males are almost 7% less likely to be lecturers and males are 10% more likely to be professors. Yeah. Given that there's an academic salary difference between those job ranks, that's going to be part of the story why there's a gender difference in pay. Um, and you can see that being older is associated with, um, as you get older, you're associated with higher chances of being promoted into higher ranks. You can either see it going this way or you can see it going this way. Okay, and here's our characteristics. So these are all the characteristics that are significant. So the dominant characteristics that are important for the probability of being in different job ranks are the productivity characteristics. PhD, public 
education support, teaching never comes up. And then whether you work part-time and having an outside offer, and they're all moving the way you'd expect. Or being more productive is associated with an increased chance of senior job growth. So we found that there's a nine log percentage point overall pay gap. We found that men are 6% less likely to be lecturers, 10% more likely to be professors. What about within rank gender pay gaps? So we did our earnings function from the first stage and we did it within each job rank. And here's our pay gaps. We're only looking at 85% and 80% significant, but even so it looks like there's a 7% um, within rank gender pay gap. So men are 10% more likely to be professors, and then if they're in that pay, if they're in that rank, they're looking at having an extra 7% um, unexplained gender pay difference. Okay, over time, what can we do over time? Well, Blackaby et al. Um, looked at the UK in 1999. So their data set is no longer in existence, and even if it was, we couldn't use it because, of course, it's confidential. But what we did was we tried as close as we could to replicate their model and see what happens to our results. So they found a pay gap of 9.4 log points, and they found at the lecturer level that there was a 6% gap within rank, pretty significant, and at professor, le professor level they found three, but not significant. So we found in our last lot of data, and these were the other way around. When we replicate their study, and it tells you the differences, the main differences in our study and theirs is that they have this, they use work experience and tenure as well as age, and when we tried that, we just couldn't get it to work. So, but when we replicate without that, we find that we would get a 10 log percentage point gap and um, no significant gap at the lecturer level, but a really sizable gap at the professor level. So our results suggest consistent with what we've, we've done with our own model that looks like there is now a substantial within professorial pay gap that wasn't in the literature before and no longer a substantial within lecturer pay gap. But the overall pay gap is still looking about the same. Conclusions. So, am I going all right time-wise? Okay. So basically, um, we've got a nice new data set. We combine it with the Women's Committee's data set and it's quite rich. What we find to be really important in terms of salary are productivity characteristics, and we would expect that, um, except for excellent teaching, which doesn't seem to come in at all. We find some workplace characteristics are also associated. We don't find any demographic stories except for gender and age. Um, we find a substantial and significant gender pay gap in the raw data of 15 log points, and roughly a third of it is due to is explained, and most of that is due to demographics and age. And roughly two-thirds is unexplained, and most of that is due to gender differences in rewards and productivity. Um, so we find gender is also significant related to job rank. Males are less likely to be employed as lecturers, and they're more likely to be employed as Given that we know there's a substantial pay difference between those job ranks, that's part of the story. Yeah. We also find evidence at a lower confidence level that within the professorial pay rank, there's um, a gender pay gap as well. So men are 10% more likely to be professors, and then once they're in there, they're looking at an extra 7% premium because of their gender. And really surprisingly, well, maybe not, because this is also consistent with what they found at the LSC, um, the conditional pay gap hasn't changed. In fact, the pay, the LSE one they found has increased to 9%. But at 9%, it's consistent with what we have. But for us, comparing to the previous UK study, for all academic economists, there's no decline in the gender <coughs> pay gap in 20 years, despite substantial growth of women into the workforce. Um, but the nature of the pay gap has changed dramatically. So there's less push for women into lectureships where there's a high pay gap. There's now more push of males into professors where there's a strong pay gap in their favour. So 
We would conclude that this pay gap is primarily related to gender differences in returns to productivity. So the unexplained nine points is primarily related to that. And that suggests that there's a role for intervention, yeah? because we've got gender difference in promotion into rank, and we've got a gender difference on pay within rank. And a policy intervention could be having individual role reviews that actually go back and look at our individual CVs and do a comparison and think about where we should be and what our pay should be. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you very much for organizing this session, Sarah. Um, so this paper that I'm presenting today is joint work with um, Karen Mumford from York and also Richard McManus from Canterbury Christ Church. And um, so what we're looking at here um, is we focus on the probability of being submitted to the REF, the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, which I'm sure that most of you are aware of and know it quite well, but for those of you who may not be from the UK, um, what the REF is, it's a national assessment exercise that judges the research quality of academic institutions in the UK. Um, REF is very important for institutions and departments alike because a lot of the government research funding that gets allocated um, depends on the REF outcomes. So if you're from the UK, you know exactly how important this is. If you're not, trust me, it's very important. Um, <laughs> In particular, we look at the determinants of the probability of being submitted to the REF, and we focus on um, lecturers, so the lecturer grade uh, in economics departments. So let me just start off with um, basically submitting to the REF, which is what I like to call the recognition phase. So this is where the, the researchers, the departments, the institutions get recognized for their research quality, for their work. This then leads to rewards, so in the form of extra funding from the government, um, but as well rewards and non-financial rewards in terms of um, prestige and reputation for the different institutions and departments. This then goes on to affect the research quality in the future, of course. So if you have more resources, you're probably going to be able to produce better quality research later on. So ideally, we would close this loop here and then go back to recognition where the next wave of REF is going to happen. I think it, it was about every six years. We're not really sure when the next one is going to be, but when the, the next uh, wave of the REF, the recognition phase happens, this research quality is going to feed into that. However, there is one important step uh, between research quality and the recognition of research quality which is the submission decision. So departments and institutions have to decide um, who they are going to submit to the REF. For those of you who don't know, um, 
up until this point, the REF requirements were such that not all academics had to be submitted, so the departments could choose who they wanted to submit. So in this sense, it would make, sorry, so it would make sense for departments to choose to submit only those individuals that they think would rank very, very highly in order to maximize the REF outcome. The problem is that we noticed um, a lot of uh, inequalities in the REF submission rates. So before I go on to show you the breakdown of the REF submission rates for 2014 REF, um, I need to first tell you a little bit about the requirements of being submitted to the REF. So just really, really quickly, um, hopefully this will make sense to most of you, but um, so the idea is that if you've been a researcher or an academic for a really long time, then, you are then the, the department is required to submit four outputs for you in order to actually submit you into the REF. So that person has to have four outputs. We call those not early career researchers. So these are people who have been working for um, a long time. Um, and so for the REF 2014, these are people um, who that began their independent research on or before July 31st, 2009. Moving down a row, um, we've got late, what we, what we call late early career researchers. So there's this whole group of early career researchers. Uh, and we have late early career researchers who began their academic independent research between August 1st, 2009 and July 31st, 2010. So these, are, these dates are specific to the REF 2014. And for these individuals, the departments um, had to have, sorry, the individual had to have three outputs in order for the department to submit them to the REF. Moving down one more row, we've got middle early career researchers, and for these guys, they needed to have two outputs in order to be submitted. And for people who had just started out working in academia, these are early, early career researchers, EECRs as we call them for the, uh, in this paper. Um, they were only required to have one output, and these are individuals who began independent research between August 1st, 2011 and October 31st, 2013. If you began doing your research after October 31st, 2013, um, you were not eligible to be entered in the REF 2014. Okay, so hopefully now you've got a good idea of our um, not early career researchers and ECRs, late, middle, and early, year, early career researchers. Okay, so here we have submission rates, um, and what I'd like to point out is the difference between the female lecturer submission rates. Um, let me see if I can use this. What we have is a 40% submission rate for, uh, among uh, female lecturers, and among male lecturers, we have a 53% submission rate. So that's a gender gap of 13%. The other thing that I would like to point out uh, from this table is the fact that there is um, a, a range, a large range of submission rates between those who are not early career researchers and the early career researchers. So for um, not early career researchers, um, they require four outputs, remember, to be submitted to the REF. We've got a 17% rate, um, a submission rate to the REF 2014. For the late early career researchers, we've got 41%, so it goes, it jumps up by quite a lot. And then again, for middle early career researchers, we've got 53%. So that, there are these numbers over here. Um, and then for early early career researchers, we have the highest submission rate, which is 67%. In total, we have a 49% um, percent submission rate for all lecturers in UK. Um, institutions.
So why is this a problem? I mean, we observe these inequalities, um, but the issue becomes what happens to these academics if they are or are not submitted into the REF. So on one hand, you may think that there are no repercussions, at least no negative repercussions of not being submitted to the REF. Um, it is not in your contract, you know, it, promotion is not based on whether or not, officially not based on whether or not you were submitted to the REF. Um, however, given that departments and institutions receive additional resources um, based on the REF uh, results, we believe that it's likely the case that um, there are consequences to whether you are included in the REF or not. And so uh, you could think of, for example, there is a shift in responsibilities. So people who are submitted to the REF are more likely to be given more time for research and less time for teaching, whereas people who were not submitted uh, may be given more time or may be given more teaching responsibilities. So that would take away from their teaching time. Um, resource allocation, again, it's about what you give your academic staff. So it's about time for research, but it's also about um, resources to, um, you know, such traveling to conferences or research funding. And also it has an effect, we believe, is likely to have an effect on the self-esteem and of the, of the individual being submitted to the REF or not, and also um, on peer recognition. Uh, so this, just so you know, that whether you were submitted or not is public information, so you can go to the REF website and see who was submitted or not for each individual academic from, um, so well, you can see who was submitted um, from all of the institutions. So it's public information, anyone can go and look this up. Um, we also believe that um, whether you are submitted or not is particularly important for less experienced academics. Um, they are particularly vulnerable to not being submitted. Um, and so these are basically, you know, saying the same thing. If you've heard of the Matthew effect or accumulated advantage or positive negative feedback, loop, feedback loops, they're all saying the same thing in that if you are submitted, um, there is a positive uh, reward for you, and so you are likely to do better research in the future. If you're not submitted, there is a negative reward for you, so you're likely to do worse in the future. So if there are any inequalities to begin with between, say, males and females being submitted to the REF, this will just emphasize that as you then move into the future. So even if the um, rates for males and females are spurious in the beginning, it will cause more inequality later, um, further down the road. Um, and so because we think that these less experienced academics are the, vulner the more vulnerable uh, people in academia to the REF submission process, um, we look at the lecturer grade. I'm going to quickly go over this because um, I don't have a lot of time, but there is, for example, the Stern report in terms of literature related to this topic from 2016, uh, which is quite a well-known report, um, and they uh, find gender differences in submission rates, not just in economics, but across all um, the different um, departments, sorry, all the different disciplines in UK institutions. Um, they also find evidence that uh, there are incentives for uh, departments to submit people, not necessarily with the best quality research, so, um, yeah, okay, okay, oh, okay, okay, thanks, <laughs> sorry. Um, so then, if you want to know more about the literature, we can talk about it later. Thank you. So what we use is the Royal Economic Society Women's Committee survey, um, which is just what Karen was talking about earlier, but it's a highly improved version of that. So our co-author, Richard, 
Um, he went online and did a lot of research on the lectures from this um, that we have in this survey and looked at their outputs, the quality of their outputs, whether or not they were submitted to the REF, um, things like that. So we have UK, UK academic lectures, we have all of them from 2008 to 2014. We know their submission status, whether they were submitted to the REF 2014 or not. Um, we have um, their career status, so whether or not they're early career researchers or not. Uh, date of their first publication, number of accessible outputs in the period eligible for REF, and uh, journals and rankings, co-authors, and institution controls. We use a standard probit model, and these are the results. So, sorry, summary statistics, and these are the results. So we find the unconditional um, gender gap of 13%, as you know, from the raw data. And I'm just going to go to the uh, fourth column, which is right here. So that gets reduced to 9.7 uh, percentage points when we condition for number of publications, number of working papers, and all the other controls. Can I have one more minute, please? Um, so the one thing that I would like to point out is that if you are an early, early career researcher, even after we condition for all these other characteristics, you are still a lot more likely to be submitted um, to the REF uh, compared to the baseline, which is not early career researcher. And also, one more thing, if you are from a department that did really well in the 2008 RAE grade, grading exercise, which is the precursor to the REF, you are also a lot more likely to be submitted um, to, the, um, to the REF 2014. But this is stronger for males than for females. I'm gonna skip that. So these are just some conclusions. Um, let me just say that we would like in the future to be able to track this cohort of lecturers and consider the longer term promotion and research output implications of their inclusion or exclusion from the REF. So that's what we would like to be able to do in the future. Thank you. Okay, so, um, uh, it's loud. Um, it's very interesting, if, if not a little bit depressing, uh, some, some of the results in, in, the, um, in, the, in the two papers. Um, so just, bef just, before we, uh, just before I kick off with my comments, um, I thought I'd do a bit of real-time stuff, and I thought we'd have a little count of the num number of men and women in the room. Uh, and so, it, and uh, I also, given you know we have measurement error and data, I asked three of my co-authors who are sitting in here to do the same thing as well. So it looks like, and of course, people come and go a little bit, and so it may not be perfectly accurate. But it, was, uh, it seems there's 58 women and 37 men. Uh, so let's face it, straight away we're talking to a selected sample here. Women are massively overrepresented in this room, uh, whereas they're less represented in, in the profession to start. Okay, so that's one empirical observation that I think we could start with, which is probably quite useful. Um, okay. Um, so, just to summarise very quickly, the seemingly persistent gender wage differs amongst academic economists, and there's some changes in composition in that over time, uh, but they seem to be fairly persistent and, and not shifting very much um, through time. There's been progress on employment gaps uh, in, in, at different levels, and so the position has improved over time, uh, but the progress seems to be relatively slow. Um, and in the REF, there's been gender gaps at lecturer level. Um, in rates of submission to, to the last, um, last exercise. Okay, so I just want to make three points, uh, three, well, three sets of comments I, I just want to make uh, on, on, on these kind of issues. The first one's about gender gaps in the academic economics profession. The second one's about gender issues in the REF. And the third one, I actually think we really just ought to be getting a practical policy discussion together on this stuff because the rate of change is pretty slow. Okay, and so I'm, I'm going to put some forward, forward some discussion about practical policy issues of relevance to one and two after I've made my comments on one and two. Okay, okay so there's, four, there's actually four observations on, on, each, on each, each of these areas that I, want, I wanted to make. Um, one of which is that uh, not unlike the overall labour market, where, where the overall labour market stands now, um, if you look at 
gender wage differentials across the whole of the um, workforce, uh, there was very little or, or even no gender gap on entry, uh, particularly if you look within education groups. Actually, if you look at low education groups, actually there's a gender gap in favour of, uh, of, 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 of women entering the labour market uh, in, in their teen years compared, compared, in their teenage years compared to men. Uh, so actually, the position actually doesn't look particularly unlike uh, what's, what, what, what's there in the overall labour market. Um, second thing is the idea that many people say, oh, this is all going to be okay, it's all going to fix itself, because you know, if, you, if you kind of think about what's going on in terms of cohorts over time, uh, there's, you know, at some point we'll converge. Uh, actually, if you look at the numbers, really, the rate of convergence is pretty slow. Uh, and, and, and the fact that wage differentials are still not moving uh, and narrowing in the face of increased, if you want, increased supply of women at higher levels, uh, is, 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 it suggests it's pretty slow that. And so I think when we think about practical, uh, and, and so the, second, the third point is related to that as well, the promotion gaps are, are, are narrowing, um, but they're still very big. And so the rate of convergence is, is pretty slow. The other observation, which, which may be uh, is, 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 is an obvious one, uh, the economics profession is much worse on other aspects of diversity. Uh, it's not so bad on gender uh, compared to some other disciplines. It's terrible compared to some. Uh, but on, on other things, uh, like on BME um, status, it's pretty awful. And actually on people coming from working class backgrounds, from, from low income families, it's pretty awful. Um, and we ought to be thinking about the whole kind of issue. If, if, if our objective function is we care about gender, race, um, income inequalities, uh, family background inequalities, and I think you know we, we really ought to be very concerned about, about about some of these things, and actually try and do something about it rather than just. Um, well, well I'll, I'll, I'll save that on the last slide. Oops. Okay. On the ref, I've got a little less to say. Um, again, again, economics relative to other disciplines. Well, it's not the worst, but it's clearly not the best either. Uh, it's better than some of the um, better than some of the uh, physical sciences, uh, but it's not very good relative to um, uh, other social sciences. Um, on the, on the lecture issues, yeah, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. But it, what seems to be happening, if, certainly if we follow the Stern recommendations, uh, it's yet to be completely determined, but it seems like everybody will be submitted to the ref. So this issue about um, women uh, at lecturer level not being submitted, well, they'll have to be submitted. And so it isn't really so much, of, so much of an issue. And again, I'm going to put D down there again as diversity, uh, which is actually a relevant issue in the ref uh, for economics to be um, thinking about um, as well. It's, as I say, if our objective function is, is about achieving gender and race equality, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, so I know some people aren't, and that's going to um, speak to on the next slide um, a little bit as well. Okay, so practical observations. Let's not just pay lip service to these issues. Uh, the rate of convergence isn't that fast. Uh, we should do something about it. Okay, so wh wh what could we do? Uh, well, I think there's three things here. I've got a fourth, a fourth one that I might throw in as well, given this is the RES, uh, Women's Committee. Um, so let's have a proper discussion about issues to do with equal pay. And let's have a proper discussion about issues to do with positive discrimination and affirmative action. And let's try actually to weigh up what the benefits and the costs of those two things are properly, rather than uh, just saying, oh, you know, you know, no, positive discrimination is really bad, costs too much. So let's actually think a little bit more carefully about it. Because if we actually think in a more dynamic setting, actually, that, uh, that actually, for example, if we adopted some form of affirmative action or positive discrimination and pointed some people to particular levels, of course you can start offsetting any costs associated with them if, if there are positive role model effects in due course. If, again, if our objective is about um, trying to um, achieve gender and race, and race equality. And something else I'd like to say here as well, and I think, I think the gender mix in here actually may say something about this, um, is if people actually want to say the status quo is good, uh, then I'd like them to come up with some evidence of why they think that's actually true. Um, so I thought it was rather interesting in an in, in, in even more poorly attended um, RES AGM, uh, the RES were talking about their consultation that they've been, they've been undertaking. And actually, uh, there was a, quite a, a bunch of people who said that actually diversity issues are not a problem in economics. Uh, so I'd like those people to tell us why diversity problems are not an issue in economics. I think that would be rather interesting uh, to, to, see, to present some evidence uh, on, on that. Um, and then the other thing, I suppose, you know, the, the last observation before I shut up is that, uh, you know, the RES does have a, a, a lot of uh, reserves uh, and could actually probably throw some money at this, at this issue uh, in a nice targeted way of some sort. Sorry, more money at this issue.
Thank you for inviting me today. As a feminist and an economist, I'm regularly asked, what do the two have in common? And my answer is always, not nearly enough. And so I'm starting here with a mosaic of the goddess of commerce. Note, not the god of commerce. It comes from a monument to 20th century American capitalism, the Woolworth Building, which is one of the, America's first skyscrapers. Now, the two papers presented in this session add to a mountain of statistical evidence that economics has a gender problem. That includes Alice Wu's now very famous work on gender stereotyping in economics, Erin Hengel's paper presented at the recent American Economic Association conference, publishing While Female, Betsy Stevenson and Hannah Zlotnick's work on the lack of female presence in economic textbook examples, and Heather Sarson's work on how men and women in economics benefit differently from co-authorship. Um, now, in terms of the particular papers presented to us today, I think one of the great strengths is the comparisons both over time and across um, different disciplines within academia um, and with the economy-wide gender gap. I think it's only by benchmarking how we're doing in economics with what's going on in academia more generally and in terms of the economy more generally that we can really see um, where we stand. One of the most interesting takeaways for me was in terms of the evidence that women's earnings seem to be based more on publications and research income compared with men, whereas men's earnings within the economics profession tend to benefit more from being at a top six department and at an older university. And that difference, I think, is telling us something and should concern us. And I think the other important takeaway with regard to the, um, um, the other paper is the arbitrariness of decisions about submission for REF. Um, so, as Christina noted, there's, a, there's uh, the majority of the variation in the regressions that she presented cannot be explained. That suggests a real problem. I think it's useful to bear in mind in regard to both papers that it's likely that, that they're presenting a lower bound, that the problem is actually much greater than these papers um, suggest. So, for example, when it comes to gender wage gaps and the Oaxaca blinder decomposition, there are a number of common recognized biases that are known in regard to that type of approach. Selection bias, for example, um, that we can try to alleviate with the Heckman two-stage um, process. Biases that arise with the way in which age enters into the regression and differences in access to endowments that can mean that the, the standard approach is missing out on something. Now, that's not a criticism of these papers, just a realization that as a profession, we know that um, we might not be entirely capturing discrimination or the more general problem with this type of approach. And so what I want to do is to focus our minds on the raw data. And that is, at the end of the day, the underrepresentation of women in economics at all levels. Here is the data for the US. Here we have female professorship in Berkeley. Economics is the worst of all the subjects, even some notable STEM subjects. And here we have undergraduate students in economics in the UK. Um, economics um, compared with um, some STEM subjects, including maths, and we can see how poorly we um, perform. Now, um, the other mainstay of academic um, work is, uh, are the books that we publish. And uh, again, this adds to uh, the, our mountain of evidence that we face a problem. Two books here in regard to two of the big economic problems we face, secular stagnation, slowdown in growth, and capital in the 21st century on inequality. Secular Stagnation, published by Baldwin and Toylings, has around 21 contributors. Not a single one is female. Gender doesn't receive a mention. Piketty's book mentions gender once.
Evidence of the gender gap raises two questions, the causes and the consequences. I'm going to point out three deep issues, three um, adverse consequences. First of all is the way in which the lack of women has affected the bread and butter of economics, the types of questions we ask, the measurements that we make, and the tools and assumptions that we use. And I point you here to Julie Nelson's work. Secondly, our understanding of the past, of how we got to where we are today, a rich economy today, and lessons for poor countries. And there, I think, gender, in particular women's freedom, has been neglected. And then, sec uh, then thirdly, our understanding of present-day economic problems, things like inequality and secular stagnation, where gender, again, doesn't get much of a look in. In terms of what we do going ahead, then ultimately what we face is a vicious circle where the lack of women in economics has shaped the way that economics has developed as a discipline in a way that I believe has put off a diverse group of economists feeding back to the lack of women and we're in that virtuous circle. And ultimately the question that we face as a profession is this, lean in versus lean out. Do we change women? Or do we change economics? No prizes for guessing my own answer.